My name is Wendy Hinman. I am at the Wooden Boat Festival. I'm really excited to be here because this is a festival I've been coming to for many, many years. And I love wood boats. I sailed around the Pacific on a wood boat, a 31-foot wood boat, a Tom Wiley design. So it's only 31 feet long, uh, nine and a half feet wide. It drew 8,000 pounds, or was 8,000 pounds. And it was a pretty light, pretty tender boat. But my husband and I were on a cheap budget and we decided we wanted to take off and go on an adventure. That was the money we had. We just did it on the cheap. And we sailed 31, 34,000 miles around the Pacific. I wrote a book about it, so I'm here at the festival doing presentations and promoting the book and we went to some amazing places on our adventure and and we didn't need all the extra stuff that a lot of times you hear about in these these magazines that tell you how to go cruising and these these seminars that tell you how to go cruising we just did it on the cheap and uh, when stuff broke we just dealt with it sometimes we just figured out how to live without it there was one time when we had some issues with our batteries and we were down to one light bulb and we were sharing a light bulb to read at night and uh, we still had a great adventure I don't think we had a worse adventure than the other people who were out there in the 40 and 50 foot boat book 50 so this foot is a picture boats. of the boat that we went out on so it was a wood boat cold molded built by a builder for himself to go voyaging the South Pacific. So it's had four owners before, well, it had three owners and then us. And two of the three owners had lived aboard, then we lived aboard, and the new owners are going to also go off cruising, I think. So this is the boat. We did 34,000 miles over seven years. We went down the coast to Mexico, across the South Pacific, did a couple loop-de-loops in uh, New Zealand because the America's Cup was happening and the Volvo Ocean Race and the Around Alone were big into sailing and we really wanted to be part of that whole thing. So we, we found ourselves volunteering to be the shore crew for Bruce Schwab's Around Alone race and I found myself repairing somebody else's boat for free um, just to be part of this whole thing. And then we were part of the America's Cup a little bit. We had some friends who were on the team and it was just neat to be part of that whole action. Then we decided we wanted to go to Japan. My husband had sailed around the world as a kid from the age of four, 13 to 18 and um, had a little shipwreck on the island of Fiji. So at the age of 14, got to play Robinson Crusoe for a little while. And part of our journey was to go visit some of these places that he'd seen as a child. And so we tried to go to the place where he'd been shipwrecked. It's turned into a penal colony uh, since then. But uh, we, he was there for four, from 14 to 15 rebuilding the boat, which you could have built. You could have driven a truck through the hole. Well, we went and saw that spot. And he said, you know, I don't need to sail around the world again. I did that. Uh, I want to go. How about Japan? Japan seems like a really fun, interesting place. Nobody goes there. Well, I figured out why people don't go there. It's kind of hard to sail there. It's a pretty challenging sailing, fog and, and lots of ships and so forth. But we had a few misadventures on our way to get there. We, uh, we had a meltdown of all of our electronics in the Solomon Islands. So we had a, a a moment where we lost basically ten thousand dollars worth of, of electronics and you know things that came with the boat the depth sound or the speedometer the radios and so forth so uh, we didn't have a real great way of navigating there was a uh, a boat nearby uh, that was owned by a guy who unfortunately died um, so we got a GPS from a dead guy he didn't need it anymore and <laughs> we uh, borrowed a depth sounder from another boat that was nearby and we strapped it to the bottom of a broom handle and deployed it through a PVC pipe lashed to the back of the wind vane and we limped our way 3,000 miles with a borrowed GPS and a borrowed speedometer and a lead line we bought here at the Wooden Boat Festival and we uh, we went 3,000 miles to Kwajalein where we heard that there was a US Army base and some friends of ours told us they were going there to, buy, to get jobs. So we limped our way in there and we looked around and found a way to get jobs so that we could fix our boat, so we could do more than just limp another 3,000 miles. So the problem was we had to figure out a way to get the boat out of the water. 
And getting the boat out of the water meant building something to get this deep keel boat out of the water. And my husband was able to find and scrounge parts on this remote island atoll under bushes submerged in the water to build this contraption that would haul our boat out of the water, but also some of the other boats that were around uh, because the cranes were broken. So he spent some time in this blazing sun rebuilding this thing, and I've got a picture of this contraption that they built. I'll show you. My book's got a whole bunch of pictures of, uh, so there's a picture of the interior. Picture of us in Fatuhiva. And then us helping out the Around Alone racer in New Zealand. This is the trailer that my husband built from scrounged parts. And he built it so that it would um, be readjustable and so that you could unload the boat as well as put the boat on. So this thing would drive into the water and the boat would float in. And then these pads you could move in and out or up and down. And then on these rails they would move in and out depending on the width and the length and the breadth of the boat. So, and the depth as well for the keel. So it was a pretty neat little contraption. He's a naval architect, so this was his great challenge while he was uh, on this remote island atoll. And uh, he did that and we were able to sell it for $10,000, this thing that we just foraged for parts. And it's now a going business in the Marshall Islands. So it's kind of a fun little diversion. So that was definitely part of the adventure. Vacationing from our vacation by getting jobs. but. So we carried on then to <laughs> carried on to uh, the Western Pacific, and I wasn't ready to go home. I thought, oh, we we need to keep going. I really love this lifestyle, and I said, let's not sail to Japan. Let let's take a little diversion into Asia. So I convinced him to t to sail to uh, Hong Kong. So he sailed into Hong Kong and played in Hong Kong for quite a while and uh, met a lot of really interesting people from melting pot from all over the world and then ultimately went down to the Philippines after a couple of typhoons rolled through gave us a little pause for excitement uh, went through the Philippines a um, little bit of corruption a little bit of um, what I would call maybe a little bit of a pirate scare um, still don't really know what we encountered but we um, we moved pretty quickly so we didn't have to find out then we, uh, we headed into this really unusual community in uh, Taiwan that uh, is an aboriginal community that is uh, closely related to the Filipinos, but yet very unique in and of itself. The, the physical resemblance of the people was quite similar, but, but the culture was very unusual. Some fascinating uh, vessels that they used to catch flying fish and uh, unusual culture, cultural uh, rituals. We, uh, then we carried on into Japan and uh, had some pretty exciting sailing there where uh, some places that people don't go. Um, we went into the Inland Sea and had a couple of pretty close encounters with some ships and um, just about caused an international incident trying to sail through an area after our engine died that um, most people don't even dream of sailing through, but it was pretty fun, pretty exciting. And we... Uh, we went on to uh, Tokyo area and um, had a typhoon roll over us there and had to wait before we could leave to head back to the United States. We sailed back to the U.S. in the cold North Pacific and it was a 46 day non-stop tra travel and we had gales following us pretty steadily threatening us to roll over us. We were dodging the highs and lows, trying to find the sweet spot that was a gentle spot to be with the boat. On day 46, within five miles of land, we saw land we could just about get in before dark. A storm hit off of Euclid, off of uh, Vancouver Island, and drove us back. And we spent three more days waiting for the storm to abate, for the waves to calm down so that we could make our way back in. We hadn't seen another human being for a uh, month and a half. And we were pretty excited to be on firm land. We pulled into that, that spot just as it was getting dark. We could barely see what we were doing. 
and I jumped onto the dock and fell flat on my face because I hadn't used my legs for a month and a half. So uh, we had a pretty exciting adventure, but part of the tough part uh, part of the, the real challenge of the adventure was coming back to society and living completely differently after being on this high adventure without much in the way of stuff and then coming back to U.S. society where everyone's running around and checking their cell phones and smartphones and uh, being on the internet every few, few minutes. We were out there with maybe a month or a month and a half without even communicating with another human being. And it was quite a shock to be back. We missed the entire Bush administration. We missed 9-11. We were in Rarotonga when 9-11 happened. We, or actually, we were on our way to Rarotonga in the Cook Islands on passage when 9-11 happened. We heard about it on the SSB radio, and we couldn't find out any good radio stations to really get the whole story. We were able to tune into Radio Africa and get the condolences, but we really had a tough time figuring out what it was that we missed. We never saw those planes going into the towers and the reaction that happened here was something that we didn't never really fully understood because we didn't see what it was that so shocked this country and the, and actually the whole world one of the reasons why we came back is that my husband actually couldn't stand up or sit up properly on the boat and after nine years living aboard he said you know I am tired of stooping he couldn't fit under the Dodger and so He'd get wet whenever the wave would fly over the Dodgers. So he said, you know, I really need to do something new. It's time to go back and, and, and do the one thing he'd always wanted to do, which was build a boat. He has learned, he's a naval architect. He's always been designing that dream boat, and now it was time. We'd done seven years of research, and now it was time to go back and build that boat. So we bought a 1920s farmhouse with a humongous warehouse big enough to build a boat and um, we're going to start building that wooden boat pretty soon here. Okay, I'm going to read. Okay. Everyone dreams of tropical escape, but what happens when you escape for too long? Imagine spending 24 hours a day with your spouse in 31 not so square feet for years. Crossing the Pacific Ocean on two gallons of fuel, tossing spaghetti marinara around the living room, and then cleaning it up while bouncing like an ice in a martini shaker. Tywad's on the loose tells the story of Wendy and Garth, that's me, lured to sea by the promise of adventure. They buy a 31-foot boat that fits their budget better than it fits Garth's large frame and set sail for an open-ended voyage, never imagining they'd be gone for seven years or s cover 34,000 miles at the pace of a fast walk. They live without most necessities and learn that teamwork and a sense of humor matter most as they face endless character-building opportunities. They make a long-anticipated visit to the island where Garth had been shipwrecked as a child, as a teenager, only to find it had become a penal colony. An electronic catastrophe in the Solomon Islands leaves them without navigation equipment, which forces them to trade their freewheeling lifestyle for one that seems straight out of a 60s sitcom, jobs at a, sh at a U.S. Army base in the Marshall Islands. In Asia, they dodge typhoons and ships that threaten to turn their home into kindling. Finally, they endure a grueling 49-day non-stop ocean crossing, but none of this prepares them for their arrival home to a post 9-11 America, which leaves them wondering what had changed more, them or the world. Taiwan's on the loose, a seven year Pacific Odyssey. It's getting great reviews, it's on Amazon.com, it's available through my website and most major webs most, most major bookstores. So, it's a, it's a fun, salty tale. A different way of living. <laughs>